break and sort of uh, let your hair down and, and have conversation about really the true impacts of development. So we're, we are really delighted to see you here. Let me grab my tea. It's green and this is yeah. green. And I'd love to say a lot of new things about uh, Dr. Yunus, but you probably know more about them. And uh, there's just so many new things every day. You, you got the prize yesterday from Equitas, and uh, <laughs> I, I can't follow everything you're doing. But the one thing I think would be very useful, the people around the table probably know quite a bit uh, about your work in microfinance and in providing empowering women. One side that they might know a bit less about is the area of social business that you've been involved in. So perhaps if you could spend perhaps five, 10 minutes on that, we'd uh, open the floor to questions from uh, everybody. Does that work? Yeah, sure. Good. Well, finally we got here. That's the important <laughs> thing. Relax, now we're just at the chat, we get to know you. And I'm very happy that I uh, got the chance to talk to you. And as uh, Jean Francois just said, uh, the activities that we are mostly spending our time right now is on what we call social business. Mm -hmm. This we are doing for a long time, but it didn't have a name or a structure or something like that. Gradually, it became uh, a debate whether you can run a business like that. And I kept on insisting, why not? Uh, it's all a question of people deciding to do something. <laughs> then you can do that. Uh, the reason people question it because we are insisting that this is a business to solve problems uh, without having any intention of any personal profit out of this. Uh, the t sticky point is how can you run a business uh, without having any personal profit out of it? I say it's all decide, it's a part of decision. If you want, uh, if your, com your company makes profit, if you don't want to take profit, nobody in the world can force you to take profit. Uh, it's my business, I decide whether I take profit, I don't take profit, that's number one. Number two is if I decide before I create the business uh, to uh, address a particular problem in a business way. So I design the business in an appropriate way. It's not just any business that I don't take profit and become the social business. You design a business to solve the problem. And in the, and particularly keep in mind if you have no intention of personally gaining from this business. Then it becomes a social business. You can take back the investment money, nothing beyond that. And we created those businesses in, the con in Bangladesh uh, to begin with. That's why we became uh, a subject of this debate. Uh, and we're saying it can be done anywhere. The kind of things we did, for example, we created a nursing college. Nursing college for girls from the villages, from Grameen families, uh, to come and become professional nurses. But instead of uh, just like any college you open, it's a kind of a donation-based, grant-based, every year you're raising money to run the school, run the college, it's not like that. We, we made it a point that it should be self-reliant. It should run by its own money, own income. So you, ha you have to have an income source for this nursing college. Uh, the idea that we started out with, when Grameen Bank gives loan for higher education, uh, Grameen Bank would be ready to give a uh, loan for these girls because they are Grameen Bank borrowers, daughters. They will give the education loan and the students will be paying the uh, uh, tuition for this uh, education and that will be enough to cover the cost of the institution. Uh, so that was the idea. We started it, and we are lucky to have collaboration with uh, Glasgow Caledonian University in Glasgow. They provided the first principal of our college. And what we did, we vacated one floor of our building, uh, which is office building, since we have no place to start right away. So we said, here we start the nursing college. And we created that nursing college. And today we already have uh, two batches uh, already graduated, and third batch is about to graduate. And we see we can cover the cost. We come to break even point in the next two years. Uh, we will cover uh, break even point. And then we continue to get the money back, which were, because it's social business, you get your money back. Uh, and these are good quality nurses. But Bangladesh has a serious shortage of nurses. Uh, we have a 
very strange doctor-nurse ratio. We have three doctors per nurse. Uh, <laughs> so there's a plenty of room for any number of young people to become nurse. Uh, still, we have a lot more non-nurse needed. Globally, there's immediately need for more than 100,000 nurses. And many countries offer uh, for any nurse to agree to come to their country, to work in their country. They offer immediate citizenship and all the other facilities. You can bring your families and all kinds of things. So need is there, opportunities are there. Young people can become professional people rather than sit around. We thought this is a good way. Once, since it works as a social business, meaning it covers its own cost, but no intention of making profit for anybody. So that's where, once you remove that, you can design it in a completely uh, different way. So once this becomes self-reliant and it starts paying back, you can build a second hospital and the third hospital, because each one takes care of itself. So if you have three, four such hospitals, as you get the flow of return money coming in, with the return money, you can build the fifth hospital. With the return money, you can build the sixth hospital. So it will be a self-expanding system. So it's uh, money generated, and as you become more known, more organized, more students will be there. Today we have only 40 students per batch. So we generate only 40 students. We can do much more. So we now have land, we can start constructing buildings and so on. Still within that framework of uh, paying back the, all the uh, investment that we made inside the, that's the whole idea of social business. We are lucky that uh, many big companies, multinational companies becoming interested in the idea to experiment with it or out of the curiosity, they want to join us in social business. One first one that we did was the Danone of uh, France, a milk company, milk product company. They became very interested. They wanted to have a social business with us. So we had a long discussion what kind of social business they would do with us. We defined their business. We said, let's do it to address the problem of malnutrition among the children, because this is a massive problem in Bangladesh. Half the children are malnourished in Bangladesh, and nothing is happening to, to improve that. So we thought maybe we should try this one in a small way, see if we can successful. So we created a company, a joint venture, 50-50 joint venture between Danone and us, and, and launched it uh, to create one very special kind of yogurt. Uh, it looks just like any other yogurt, but it's a different in the way it contains all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, everything, in the right proportion. And it is, uh, uh, the technology of Danone that after you add all those medicine into this small cup of yogurt, uh, it doesn't taste ugly because uh, that's what it should be tasting because you put lots of chemicals into it. But it tastes very delicious. So they suppressed the uh, ugly taste and made it a very delicious, attractive taste for the kids. And the kids love it. They don't, they want to eat this yogurt. And price is so low that even the poor families can afford it. So we expand it now. Uh, we are uh, doubling the size of the plant because it's a, initially it was a small plant. Now we have doubled the size uh, this year. And we will have a series of these plants, exactly the same way that I explained in our technology. Each one becomes self-reliant, uh, and we keep on adding each one more and more so that we can address more and more children into that. So that's a social business. Danone doesn't want uh, any profit out of this coming to them because they, they, did, they accept it and put it in the company memorandum and company legal framework that we will never take any dividend out of this company. And they had to uh, go through a big, big legal battle with their board, with their shareholders, uh, the lawyers particularly, they, whether company can do such a thing. Because company shareholders gave them the money to make more money for the shareholders. Can you use their money to not to make money like you do in your social business? So what Danone has done they circulated a letter to all shareholders es explaining what they would like to do in Bangladesh, explaining what the Danone uh, company in Bangladesh should be doing. And uh, this is just before the annual general meeting. And they said this is the amount that you'll be receiving as dividend for the company of Danone. And uh, if you are interested in investing in this new company that we are proposing to create, please sign up and tell us what percentage of a dividend that you're receiving you would like to invest in this company. 98% of the shareholders signed up. 
out of mm, over 300,000 shareholders, 98%. Mm. There is, in return, they received a total of 35 million euro. They needed only half million euro. They explained it in the letter, we need half a million euro for that. So they were very excited. And then uh, second round of problem began for Danone. Employees of Danone uh, attacked the management uh, by saying that you consider us as a, as a second class citizen because you ask the shareholders whether they would like to invest in this company or not, mm -hmm. but you have not asked us. <laughs> so again, management realized the fault, so they uh, sent out another letter to everybody. Out of that letter, another 30 million dollar euro came. So they in all got 65 million euro in a, 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 while they were asking for half a million euro. So they went ahead, created a fund called uh, Danone Community Social Business Fund. Out of that, they are now creating a series of social business in many countries, Cambodia, Algeria, Morocco, China, in many places. So this is again another idea of social business. Third example I'll give and I'll stop. This is from Canada. So that's why I'm mentioning that. Uh, McCain became very interested in our idea of social business. We had a series of meetings in different places in the world when we meet in conferences. The family is very interested in the social business. Uh, simple idea is we do a lot of things, uh, but uh, we have not done anything concrete to address the problems of the people in a direct way. This gives us an opportunity. So they said, please tell us how you can utilize us. We'd be very happy to uh, join you in social business. So after we involved in Colombia, uh, uh, we were in Colombia because Colombian coffee growers are uh, without any work because coffee uh, crashed for Colombia, because Asian uh, coffee from Vietnam and Indonesia, they took off the whole market. Colombian coffee disappeared from the market. So people are just sitting and generation after generation they pr produce this coffee and now nothing to do. They don't know anything else. So we said, okay, this is our opportunity to work with McCain here as a social business. Now we are growing potato in Colombia and they are very enthusiastically going on to see how to bring the best price possible and the best quality of potato in Colombia. And we are amazing, uh, they are amazing a way that they, are, they bring their experience and technology to make things ha happen. So that brings me to Canada. I'll be meeting the family uh, the after tomorrow in Toronto. Uh, so we are very closely associated. And now we are thinking about how to do it elsewhere. Uh, McCain has come up with another idea. We met in. Uh, Lund, Sweden, a uh, few weeks back. Uh, they came to see me again in Lund, where we were having a conference on social business Europe uh, because of the unemployment, youth unemployment problem in Europe. And uh, the, the reason for the conference is to see how social business can address the issue of unemployment by creating entrepreneurs out of unemployed people. Forget, sk skip the step of job hunting. Just go straight in becoming job creators rather than job hunters. So that, and, and there we discuss McCain's pr proposal. They want to start it in Lille uh, of France. So this will be one of the discussions that we'll be having there. So this is in brief what we do uh, on social business, and we'll explain later if you have more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yunus. Alors, comme vous allez pouvoir vous en compte que les échanges vont se faire surtout en français, euh, dire en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser des questions en français, on pourra bien la traduire. Professor Younes uh, répondra en anglais. Uh, in terms of the way uh, this could go, I think it would be really useful if we start with the representatives of uh, civil society organizations. And perhaps one of the interesting ways uh, we could have this conversation would be to see what, in your experience in the field as civil society organizations, what stumbling blocks have you seen? And you might want just to submit them to Dr. Younes because he's had a breadth of experience with a whole bunch of ideas uh, from range from microfinance to social businesses uh, and others. And it's, he has a knack for transforming problems into business opportunities. <laughs> so it may be something you might want to consider and ask your question. But of course, if you want to just broaden also your question, please go ahead. Just a clarification on the last sentence you made, uh, turning problems into job opportunities. Because you use, you use the word opportunity uh, to stand for money-making opportunity. Mm -hmm. Here, there is no such thing. How you solve problem in a business way. 
So we, I, would, I would not like to use the business opportunity because it's associated with money-making opportunity. So this is not a money-making opportunity. This is the opportunity to solve the problem. Stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a way people think. Yeah. Of it. Job, uh, business opportunity, people mean, ah, here's an opportunity Profit. to make some money. Yeah, that's, that's it. It's opportunity. opportunity to get to a solution. Okay. Get to a solution. Questions? It doesn't have to be related to social business. It could be anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. Uh, could you uh, mention the name of your organization and just speak up? Okay. Um, I'm actually from the Service Canada, uh, just a little bit off. Mm -hmm. um, I actually just was at your um, previous one at okay. the SEC and yeah. I rushed over here. <laughs> and you managed to make it almost as fast as us. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is a common thing that you see. It's, a, it's like a marriage, coming two family together. So it has problems because you don't know each other very well, but at the same time, you have a strong tie. Uh, you want to do something together. So those are the usual things. They come from one culture, we come from another culture, business culture, meaning. That the, so the people who are associated with you now have to turn their thinking process differently. I'm not, because always they're thinking, if I do this, will my profit increase? or I'll have less profit doing that, or can I skip it so that I have more profit at the end? Here, no such consideration. Consideration is, are the people getting all the benefits if I do this? Uh, can, can I enhance the benefit level of the people if I do this? Uh, those kinds of things. So it takes a little bit of time. Once you get the hang of it, they understand right away. They are smart people and start doing that. They are in that, not somebody forced them. It's not government nor that you have to do that or uh, any other super authority tell it is be because we, they are doing it because they wanted to do it we didn't go and kind of convince them i didn't know anything about mccain i have no idea that the company exists called mccain when they first meet us and we are very good they're talking a lot of things uh, but i i didn't know who they are so i said um, can you tell me what mccain does uh, where are you from they said we are from canada uh, but let uh, let me see how we explain. Do you eat French fries? <laughs> I said, yeah. Do you like it? I said, I like it. Uh, so anywhere in the world, if you eat French fries, you always remember you are eating McCain French fries. So I said, <laughs> my God, you are big. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I came to know about them yeah. through French fries. <laughs> That description it never goes out of my mind. <laughs> Good way to introduce, introduce themselves. So they came to us with good intentions, and they've been following us in every conference we go. McCain people will always be there to understand more and more and more and visit places where we have done uh, social business. So that is the thing. Once your mind is made, others become less involved. That can be overcome. Close to <laughs> okay. So my name is Isabel Lelaus-Jessau and I come from WISC, World University Service of Canada. So I'm, I'm interested in finding out, so it seems like a lot of your examples are with partnerships with already established businesses to try to have more of a social business angle. So I'm curious to find out if you have any examples of business startups or also access, because I know your past work was mostly access to capital for the poor. So how do we also encourage business startups particularly for youth or for women, um, and how do we access, and, and the connection of that with maybe impact investments, and how do we um, kind of bridge that aspect of social entrepreneurs, and maybe the connection of what was happening in Europe in terms of uh, starting that entrepreneurial like markup, but where, with your social business, what's that angle of supporting business startups also? Uh, let me go back to Grameen Bank, then that's a good start there. Yeah. Uh, we, are, uh, we gave them the education loan to the young, generation of coming families, they went to school, they went to college, they had good degrees, but no jobs. Bangladesh doesn't have jobs for them. So they were very frustrated years back. Uh, so they kept complaining, why did you give us the money to do all this thing which has led to nothing? It's a wasting our time and wasting our money. Then, then you're insisting that we have to pay back. When we, how do you pay you back? 
So we had a serious thought about it, what do we do now? So one idea I came uh, with, that uh, started telling them that look, you first for clean your mind uh, of this obsession with getting a job. Forget about getting a job. Who told you to have a job? Is there something written there, you have to have a job? So always remember this and repeat to yourself so that you can convince and your mind starts differently that I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator, I'm a job giver. And behave like a job giver rather than a job hunter. A job hunter is a kind of lowly job. You are at the mercy of other people. Job giver is a top job. You are a job creator, you have to do that. And very simple logic, your mother owns a bank. Your mother's bank has unlimited money. So why should you go around find a seeking job? You use the money that the bank has and use it. So that was the slowest start because they were still very hesitant to take a loan because already taken, their mother took a loan, he took a loan, she took a loan. Now you're talking about another loan. The too much loans. So they are very reluctant. Bank staff were very reluctant to give this too many loans at that. Then we turned the scenario. Forget about the loan. We create a social business fund. You come with a business idea, any business, whatever business idea you have, come with us, show us that it makes sense to anybody, and we'll give all the investment to you. We become your partner. Now not alone, we become your partner, we are the investor. We can give you 100% investment, you work for the company, and you buy off the company from us. Just generate enough money in the company to pay back the money that you take us, you took from us, it may be $20,000, $30,000, $5,000, whatever you took us, give us back, and it's your business. We hand over all the shares to you. We don't own any shares to you because as a social business, we are not here to make money out of it. Whatever we gave you, you give us back, that's enough for us. That's a social business. Now hundreds and hundreds of these young people every, every week is sitting through all these presentations and so on. And every month we uh, do another bigger presentation uh, and it's a live stream, and people from uh, over 70 countries watch us, uh, the way we are working, the kind of presentations are being made, how the questions are raised, how decisions are made, and uh, uh, they get fun funded. They, so the real business starts to scream. Uh, these are absolutely new. These are kids which come out of colleges and so on. They are very started with businesses, whatever business idea they have. Uh, so we are trying to organize them so that they understand the business techniques and so on as a few uh, uh, days of uh, orientation and so on and go ahead and we monitor them uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, internet uh, so that they, we get the information uh, daily from them, see how they are doing and weekly report, monthly report so that we can analyze them, understand them, pick up the phone, talk to them. Uh, those kind of things. So these are fresh, absolutely fresh. And the second example I'll give is coming from Tunisia. Uh, we are starting uh, our work in Tunisia. Everywhere we go, we create a social business fund and an incubation company. Uh, so this time, the incubation company started uh, uh, giving advertisement in the newspaper and um, also in radio that we are inviting social business designs to solve problems that you see around yourself make it a small piece of that problem, try to create a business to solve that problem, and uh, the total investment should not exceed $250,000 for, for, for your uh, company, and we will provide that investment, provided uh, you come up in the uh, selection procedure at the top level, then we'll do the funding. We were expecting probably 100 and 150 such business plans. We ended up with 2,300 business plans. Mm -hmm. And now each one is a brilliant business plan. Uh, each one makes so much sense. So we picked up now first dozen uh, business plans to start investing out of the fund. And as we go, and then we'll go to the next brighter ones and so on, gradually. In the meantime, asking others if they want to refine them so that they can qualify to get into the inner circle so that they can do that. So they're free to go back and identify what are the limitations of their presentations or their thinking process. and how do you improve, do we hold little workshops to discuss those things. So this is it, once you qualify, here is the investment. And there is no legal thing that where is the collateral, they have nothing, so no collateral, nothing, it's a partnership. It's my business, not your business. Together, we are partners. Let's do that together, that's it.
You have two options. You just made business model. If you want to go into business, NGO in business, it has to be business. It has to produce returns or all social business. What I'm saying. So these two. Or if you say no, it's not. It is something that we do humanitarian work. So they should give us grant and we should do the humanitarian work. That's also possible. So now uh, they have to be convinced which way they should go. Uh, they can go all all different options. They don't have to limit themselves that, okay, we'll do only this. Uh, they have the CSR money, which traditionally they have used for humanitarian purposes or business promotion purposes in the, uh, most of the time, the image building processes. So if they want to support a local school or a football team or something with their CSR money, they can still do that. Uh, or humanitarian work, they want to put CSR money in Haiti or some someplace else. They can still do that. Uh, so you can either you can have all three options for them, or you spe uh, can specialize in one option. This is the option that we give you, and this is the reason for that. So it's a question of how you present it to them, how it clicks with their own uh, way of thinking, what they can do with that money. Mm -hmm. They have some money in their mind that you want to use they, uh, for good purposes, to achieve some social goals. So these are the options available to them. So each NGO ha either have a menu or portfolio of those uh, uh, activities, or that our specialization is here. And we do this uh, humanitarian work, or we do this business work, or we do this training work. And we do this vocational training, or we specialize women empowerment. It's, it's all, all those traditional things. Uh, so I, I, I don't think I've added anything to your conversation. Do you have an example of? Oh. One way is to uh, see what service you can provide to be attractive in such an enterprise. Just just to give an example, uh, may not be appropriate one, say McCain, Potato, Colombia. So what an NGO bring to them that look, we have uh, things to provide you. Would you be interested and pay us for this? That's what I'm saying. So you have to see where is it? Is it a training, is it a marketing, is it a technology which is missing? It's women, it's the children. What piece is missing in the whole thing that we can address that? Uh, and you don't have a loud enough voice yet.
lot of policy and photos on them that opened up mu much prematurely. They're not protected. They're, uh, the production costs are very high for a number of reasons. The infrastructure is so weak. So they're just getting flooded with imports and they can't com compete even domestically. And they're having a lot of problems with exports as well. So there it seems that so many of the issues are, are structural and, and related to, to trade relations. And I'm wondering, because I'm sure this comes up with, with your work a lot, these sort of structural issues, how do you deal with that? Or if there's a role in the sort of social enterprise model for, for trying to deal with some of these structural issues as well? Uh, we try to create an, or bring our own structure uh, to see if it is not there, we create it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. For example, this is a, maybe when I made that statement, it sounds big. Actually, it's a very tiny little thing. Uh, we work in Albania, about three million people in Albania, a beautiful country, but people are very poor. Uh, many families live in the mountains with no access to market or anything. And the women in the, these mountains produce beautiful things like uh, jam, jelly, because these are everywhere there, and honey. So one N NGO, when we created the social business uh, fund and uh, incubation centers, so one NGO came up with a business plan for us that I would like to do this if you finance us. So he said, what is this business? So he brought all the samples of things uh, women produce in the mountains, uh, very attractive uh, jam, jelly, honey, and all kinds of things. And the honey is in a Coca-Cola bottle or throw away water bottle. All the jam, jelly is in a throw away cosmetic containers. So it's all there. It's, uh, then explain that this is the way they sell to their local market. And people don't have any demand for this because they have enough for themselves who wants to buy. Some outside people come because so cheap they buy it, but there's nothing they get. So what I thought, the, the guy was explaining, I thought I'll create a marketing and promotional company for this. And my job would be, what I'll do if you finance me, I'll do the containers, standard containers for honey, standard containers for jam, standard containers for each one. I'll supply them, every house. And you produce and put it, and I put the level, I put the brand, same brand for everybody. Uh, and I collect them. And then I do the marketing in the st chain stores, and in, uh, in the hosp uh, hotels, and also take it outside, be beyond Tirana. I go to the Europeans, see if I can make contact with them. So this would be my job. So producing, uh, marketing their product. They will be keeping producing, and be selling their product. And bring all the money to them because I'm in social business. I don't need any money for myself. I'll just cover the cost of my operation, and the rest goes back to them. So this is my social business. And it sounded very interesting, because it's just a, it says there's no market, no structure, nobody buys it. He crosses everything. He just jumps out. She said, I collect it, I process it, I sell it, and so on. So that project, total investment needed was $25,000. Then we had, the, in the meantime, the discussion going on. We thought this would be an interesting case to test out crowdfunding, putting on the internet, if anybody would like to put together $25,000. Kiva became very interested. Many of you are probably familiar with Kiva. They became very interested. We always did the microfinance. We never went to $25,000 loan yet. So let's try this one. So they put it in their platform, explained what, the, what this is all about, give the whole uh, pitch about the whole project. Within less than 24 hours, this $25,000 was raised. So now there's a business running. So that opened up a new door of crowdfunding. Next project Albania presented in the uh, crowdfunding was $65,000 because they get now ambitious. That you can get. It took four days to get the $65,000. Now they're getting ready with the $125,000 project. So if I don't know if that's a pro precisely the problem, the, you don't have the structure, but you cre create the structure. Not that in every case you'll be successful, but in some cases, yes, you take over everything from beginning to the end. Don't take it here and stop and say, 
it was not picked up from, from, from there, so we failed. We say we go from here to all the way. Like another example, this is again same, almost same. This is in Ghana. Shia nut. Shia nut is a nut which is produced in the forest of Ghana. Uh, women in the villages, they go out in the forest, pick this up, collect it, and then after day's work, collect some and sell it in the local market, get pins for that. And local market, middleman number one comes, he buys it, gets to the next market, middleman number two comes, he takes it to the number three market. Ultimately, these nuts end up at L'Oreal's factory. L'Oreal pays a very high money because they get a lot of money from the shea butter. This is where the shea butter is coming from. Uh, but they, the people who really collected this thing, they never got saw the money. So what we did, we created a company, a social business company, to connect the producers, take this production to bring it to L'Oreal and get the same international price they pay and bring the money back to them. And L'Oreal is very happy with it because they see that their money is actually helping people rather than just changing hands with people and making money. And they are happy because they got the money for the first time they saw they have got some money by doing what they, they still do the same thing. So you skipped everything. You linked Paris with the village of Yukon in a straightforward way. You know, that's another social business idea. All marketing, yeah, whether you are talking about Shia butter or you are talking about the cocoa producer creating nothing, co chocolate buyers are paying a lot of money, whether you are talking about the coffee growers don't ever sell any money, but the coffee drinkers paying a lot of money. It's all because somewhere in between, somebody else makes the money. So we are just skipping all this stuff. Go from one to 10, final stage. That's another one. My name is Chantal Abbas, and I work with the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. It's a network of 80 Canadian NGOs working in international development. And I'm interested in hearing how the social business model and culture can contaminate the mainstream it business should. model. It should. Because you're talking about this great partnership no, right. with uh, McCain and Danone. So it's only one portion of what they do. But with, in your experience, and maybe it's too recent to, uh, to evaluate, but um, have these organizations questioned a bit more <coughs> the way that they do their core business because of this involvement you know, that they did with social, uh, social en enterprises? Some of the <laughs> things that we do may rub on to the mainstream, may rub on. One example with Danone. When we started this with lots of enthusiasm, okay, let's get it done. We are having a big relationship with the big guy, so we'll do this. Uh, as we are preparing for production, I was asking, what kind of container would you use for these yogurts? I said, I'm interested to look at it. I said, okay, we'll bring you samples how we do that. So they brought me samples how they put this container. So I looked at this container. It's a little container, much smaller than this. I said, it looks like plastic. Tell you it's plastic. I said, in social business, plastic is not allowed. They were shocked. I said, everywhere we use this plastic, all over the world. I said, all over the world, you're a money-making company. Here you are coming to social business. So you're, all the things have to be questioned. So uh, this, to what kind of thing you are looking for? I say biodegradable, of course. We have to find a biodegradable container for this. Why do you want a biodegradable? It, it's not available. We don't know anywhere. I said, because we don't want to litter the whole country with these plastic cups all over the world, all over the country. They said, well, we don't know what to do. I said, you better figure out, because otherwise you are not fulfilling the requirement of social business. So since we are the arbiter of what is social business, what is not, so they got into trouble because uh, they cannot say, no, it cannot be done. So they're back. Four months later, they came back again from Paris. This time, they're very happy. They found it. They said, we found it. Here it is. Exactly the same container, but this is different. What is it? It's biodegradable. I said, I'm very happy that finally. said, it's not available now. You made it available. said, we have gone to 
world search for this. And finally, we find that. Where did you find it? We found it in China. What is it? What is the material? It's a cornstarch. It's a cornstarch, and it's biodegradable. We, we researched with it. It's 100% biodegradable. I said, I'm very happy. So I took this cup and took it to my mouth. Can I eat it? I said, why you want to eat it? I said, because poor people will be paying money for this. Why should poor people pay for something which they will throw away? So what do you want? I said, can it be edible? <laughs> so that people will eat the yogurt and eat the cup. And it should also have nutrition. They said, I can't believe what you're saying. <laughs> I said, ah, you try to figure it out, but that's what it should be, edible cups. And how, we never heard of edible cups. I said, I heard of edible cups. I said, when I eat ice cream, I get an ice cream cone. <laughs> I eat the ice cream and I eat the cone. But this is not ice cream. I said, that's why I'm asking you. If it is ice cream cone, I would go to the place where they make those cream cones. <laughs> you are the giant company. You have all the solutions. You have research center. You do that. So they were very frustrated. They went back. A few months later, I was in Paris in connection with other meetings. So Danone scientists wanted to see me. I said, okay, probably they are upset with me because I'm giving the task which they cannot accomplish. I was very surprised. They were very happy. I said, we are always doing the repetitive things, what has always been done, we are trying to improve it. Nobody asked me a question. You are the only person asked a new question. Now we are all excited. We are working very hard to find that happen. And someday it will happen. I said, please work very hard. It has to happen soon. So now, so after this, what happened? There are many years gone by since this happened, because now you have the biodegradable cups and so on. It's still not the edible cup yet, but the biodegradable. Danone has replaced their plastic cup worldwide. Worldwide? See, the rubbing off thing, this is the rubbing off. This is the rubbing off thing. They raised 65 billion euro, I told you, because of this uh, reputation. Now, what do we do with this? This money was given for social business. They cannot take it into their main company. So they created a social business fund. Now they have projects in 14 countries of social business with this money. So they got stuck with this social business thing. And in two years back, when uh, Frank Rivo was addressing the social, uh, their shareholders meeting, annual general meeting, I was present at that meeting. He invited me as a third special guest. So he was explaining why he's doing all these social businesses all around the world and these days, how excited he is. And he says, my grand wish is someday Danone will become a social business itself. And so important that we make it happen. He at least said it in front of his shareholders who were waiting for him to give dividends. He said, he said someday it will be a social business. So that's how it may, may not. But the fact that somebody is uttering this word is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michelle? Um, I have a question about the You want to give a name? Oh, sorry. Ah. This is Michelle. I'll not go into advantage, disadvantage. Okay. Not, I just de define what is what. Okay. What is CSR, what is social entrepreneurship, and what is social business. So that I can just define and then you forget it out. CSR was a kind of, a, she came out of a feeling in the business world that you are so busy making money, you are not going, doing anything good for the people. So they're under pressure that you have to do something for the society. Uh, just making money enough is not for the society. You make money, but others uh, don't gain from your money. So out of that feeling, they came up with an idea. Why don't we take a part of our profit and use it for benefit of the society? 
that was the whole intention of corporate social responsibility. It's a social responsibility you're performing. Because within your business, you're not performing that responsibility. So now you have to step outside of your business, give a slice of your profit, and call it corporate social responsibility. So that was a very good intention, that you can't do it in your main business, so you do it outside. But as business would do it, for a while they did it, and gradually they found a way to use it for their business purpose. They said, well, I'm giving away the money anyway. Why don't you use it in a way that I build my image? So they started building image with this money. They do it in a way, if you are doing it, uh, they use this fund, for example, a music festival, sponsored by such and such. Every minute you say, sponsored by such and such. Don't let you forget who is doing this. So that way you see you're a good guy, you do this. Or you are promoting a cricket team. All over their body, cricket player, that is sponsored by this, this blend. So you do that. So they couldn't allow the, even that thing to go uh, silently, quietly to do that. They want to take some juice out of it for themselves. So that is the fate of the corporate social responsibility. But this is really money to give away. That's what the intention. And you, sometimes you write a check, give it to an NGO, do good things, education, healthcare, women, children, or whatever. Well, it is a check. So writing check is the thing. We selected you, we trust you, we give the money, you do a good job, send us a report. That another CSR activity. You are not doing it yourself, simply giving to somebody else. So that's the CSR part. I'm simplifying it a lot, but basically that's what it is. Social entrepreneurship is a broad concept. If you are, if you somehow benefiting the society, you're taking an initiative as a person, you are a social entrepreneur. You don't have to run a business. You still be a social entrepreneur. It's nothing to do with business. You could be running an uh, NGO, but did a wonderful thing to an NGO. You are a social entrepreneur. You could be running a business, and a business which helps people. It's creation of jobs in a massive way, or a big way, or a significant way, or creating a job, a special kind, where you help the handicapped. But you make money by doing that. But the fact that you did something which is not normally done by everybody else, you are a social entrepreneur, because you created a new frontier for yourself. So it's a, it's a money-making business could be a social, uh, social entrepreneur. NGO leader could be a social entrepreneur. Most of the ent social entrepreneurs are uh, coming from the NGO sector. He's a social entrepreneur, he's done something. Uh, or it could be nothing to do with uh, any money transactions. He did it out of something. He helped people to do certain things. He take an initiative. He can be a social entrepreneur too. So that's a wide thing. Social business, first of all, it's a business. CSR is not a business. Social entrepreneurship is not a business. It may be a business, not all of it is not a business. If it is a business, it may be money-making business. It could be an NGO too. But social business is a strictly a business. It has to be sustainable. It has to get the money back. But the unique feature of social business is it delinks itself for personal profit making. That's what distinguishes it from the conventional business, where the focus of your business is to make money. Here, the focus is to solve the human problem in a business way. So in a way, you can say, take the objectives of the NGOs, put a business methodology behind it, and take the profit making out of it, personal profit making out of it, and it becomes a social business. Um, so these are the basic three differences. We, I'm not judging good, bad, or other things, but it's a question of how, how you want to position yourself, that's all. What would be my recommendation? Well, just meaning, like, is, there, is that becoming uh, more of a trend? Like, do you see that more often? When people no, this is just the beginning. I mean, yeah. I, all I'm saying, suppose somebody is saying, I'm a company, I have a CSR money, should I give it uh, as a charity, as a check to somebody, to NGO, or should I invest in a social business? I'll say, look, charity is a wonderful thing. It achieves great things. So it's up to you. So charity is not something that you can question. It's a wonderful thing. But one limitation of charity is money goes out, does the work, 
money doesn't come back. It, your money will have one time use. But if you invest in a social business with the same objective, money will go out and come back. And ready to go back again to do more work. So you have endless use of the same money. It will never disappear from the face of the earth. Keep on working, keep on working. Because you created a machine which runs by itself. So your choice. You have achieved the same objectives, but has different results out of it. And then next year, your CSR money goes into another social business, or the same social business becomes double, or you have two social businesses. And you have two social business forever and ever, if they successfully run this business. And it's a business. You know the business, right? And this is dedicated to solving a problem. Over time, you can improve it. You can bring new technology to it. You can expand this. Lot of things, because it's an organism now. It's not something dead. It has its own life. I'm going to take the prerogative uh, here just to ask a question. I've been burning to ask the question. Uh, and that's just going to bring us back also to the world of microfinance. As an economist, I'd be interested in your views in your very broad experience in the financial field. Would you say first, just on the very topic of social businesses, to start, you need to have startup capital. What's the availability of that around the world? So you seem to basically have no shortage of ideas, from what I can see. How are these ideas met with actual venture capital? That's the first question. And the second question, still on the availability of capital. In the world, the microcredit summit campaign says that it seems to that we've reached a bit of a plateau in terms of the number of people having access to microfinance. Do you think we're reaching a plateau because there's just so many entrepreneurs among the very poor people? Or again, is it a matter of access to capital? That is, if you want the sum unlock. Well, I'll put it this way. One good thing about social business it doesn't have to be big. It starts very small. If you can create a small social business, suppose to address the problem of youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. What you try to do, design a business, social business, to take five unemployed people out of unemployment situation. We can sit down, spend 15 minutes, we'll have many ideas how to do that. And the Price tag probably will be $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. That's about it. But with $20,000, and you see it become a sustainable business, it co covers itself, and they will have decent salary for them. They will be enthusiastic workers mm -hmm. in this company. And company pays for itself. It pays back $20,000 that has been invested. It still runs it. These five people are still doing it. And the, all the profit will be plowed back into it mm -hmm. after you have paid back your $20,000 and you have an opportunity for the sixth person. So you created another seed. Mm. You solved the problem of our five people's unemployment. If you can demonstrate it, I don't think there will be lack of money for the next five. Okay. Everybody said, how did you do that? Why don't I give you the money, do it again? It's all a question of demonstrating. Mm. Mouthing about all these things is fine. People, ah, maybe, maybe not. But when you see in your neighborhood it happen, you cannot resist yourself. You are sick of seeing these unemployed young people sitting around. You say, well, at least I can help. I can invest, and I'm getting my money back. And I, next one will be a better idea than the one we did, because I have another idea. I'll try it. So the money is not a problem. It's a problem of whether we believe in it. And believing will not just come because somebody said so. They want to see concrete example. So the, making the first concrete example is the thing. And once you have done that, reputation becomes very easy. The whole world is looking for solutions. Solution of the poverty, solution of unemployment, solution of all these problems, solutions of people uh, remaining sick. If you found a way of solution in a business way, the whole world will be at your door. Please help us. Here is the money. Government spends billions of dollars. International agencies spend billions of dollars to do those things in one way. 
They don't come back. You are saying this money will come back and I'll give it to you, but it still it work. So I don't think money will be an issue. Issue is how far we want to do that in the first year. That's why when we go and make it, many of them is very early stage because we just began in Colombia and Tunisia and so on. In Bangladesh, it's the longest history because we have been doing it for many years. So people want to see. That's why we, people, when they become serious, one of the th things they, they want to go and see this first. And then mm -hmm. say, oh my God, it makes sense. I want to do it. And all those uh, projects that we did, we had the initial money because people said, okay, you go ahead, we'll give you the initial money. See, show us what you do. And that's the money we're using now. In Albania, in Tunisia, mm -hmm. in Colombia, in Brazil, in every country. So some people gather and said, okay, we give you the initial money, you go showing us. And then if it works, we'll bring all the money you need. It's a question of the test of it, or how far you can go. That, like you gave the example, I gave the example of malnutrition. This is one. Another big issue is uh, water. What is a massive problem all over the world? Bangladesh, which is a very rich country with water, plenty of water, but nothing to drink. Surface water is totally polluted. Groundwater is arsenic contaminated. So caught in between. So people are drinking poison every day. Children drinking poison every day. Half the population of Bangladesh have to drink poison every day because of ourselves. They have no other option. So we created a small social business, joint venture with Veolia, the French company. Mm -hmm. Treat local surface water and make it very safe water. Run it through the village. People come with their jars, fill it up, and pay a small money for each liter or 10 liters. Which is sold in 10 liters kind of uh, pricing. So you fill it up and pay the price and go. It is clean water. Very small price. You can afford it. But you cover the cost. That's a social business. Now, if it is successful that we have been able to, whole village can be done in this way, and people are willing to pay, and regularly pay, you are not running out of money. Then say, why don't you do it to another village? The same thing. If it, you cover your cost, why people must drink poison? If you say, no, no, the government should solve it. Government is not solving it. So you do that. Like government is not solving the problem of electricity in Bangladesh. So we created a business, social business, to bring solar energy in the villages. After 17 years now of this work, now we have one and a half million homes with solar energy. And it became so popular now, solar energy in the villages, many other companies coming to do that. So in total, we have nearly 3 million homes already with solar energy. And in the next four years or five years, we'll have at least 6 million homes, double the number. It took us 17 years to come to 3 million, but it will take only three or four years to get it 6 million. That's it. So these are, these are each one of them. It's a, idea that you put into practice in a business way. So money keeps rolling, money keeps continuing, and you keep solving. And it becomes, after a while, it becomes very obvious and very simple to convince people because we tell them that you use kerosene lamp. So you're buying kerosene every day or every week. Give us the money that you spent on kerosene for a month. Every month you put this money and give this money to us, we give you solar energy. For three years, you give this money. After three years, you don't have to pay any, a penny for this. You get all the energy free. You don't have to buy kerosene. You don't have to buy anything. And people like that idea. And it's a social business. We are not there to make money from you, so it's OK. So the basic point is money is not the issue. If you can do that, money will be at your feet because you solve the problem of the people. And what about access to credit for household, poor households? What is microfinance, are you yes. talking about the micro? Well, that is still a big issue uh, because the banking system has, been, has not been reformed. Banks is still remain the bank. And I said, the banking law in each country, we call it a banking law, actually underneath it is, it is the banking law for the bank for the rich. <laughs> For the first time in Canada yesterday, banks announced they might actually consider opening 
a bank account where the poor will be able to put their meager resources and not have to pay to put their resources in the bank might be considered. Yes, that's again, it came from the political side. Yeah. Because political side has insisted that you have to take this account. We have a big struggle in the USA where we run the Grameen program. In Grameen system, you have to save every week. So in New York City, where we have six branches, they have to save every week. And the standard amount that they have to save every week is $2. Every week, you must do that. No bank wants to keep this money in their account. I said, this money, just keep that money. We collect them all. It's not $2. We collect them all, put it in one pot, and keep the record who paid so much for ourselves. No, it's too small for us. So we have to shake up the whole banking structure there, go all the way to the CEO of the big, big bank to make this small decision of one branch. And finally, he said, OK, OK, we'll make you do that. And the branch staff is totally hostile to the whole idea. There's no problem. You saw that by political decision. That there's no political. Yes, please. I'm interrupting. No, no. No, no, go My ahead, John. and I know each other for many years. I know, I know. Yeah. I was watching you there. Well, you're a, a social entrepreneur who's been at work doing these things for many, many years. I've known you for many, many years as you've been doing this. And always the challenge is, well, not always, but one of the most important challenges is how to go to scale. How to, maybe we have to have a cloning machine for Mohammed Yunus, but I don't think that's one of your projects. But we should do that. Why not? Well, well, <laughs> depends if it can be a sustainable in business. The, sustainable in, business. That's all that in the absence of that model, because we have concerns about population control and things like that nowadays, <laughs> what is the mechanism for transferring these skills and these ideas to a whole new generation of social entrepreneurs? I mean, we have here in Canada a government which is talking an awful lot about the relationship between the traditional aid program, the one you me working on, and the role of the private sector. And I'm somewhat dubious that we can establish that link, but that's just my personal perspective. But you've got living examples of these connections being made by with a few companies. But they are, not to diminish what you're saying, there are a few companies. So what is in your mind the challenge of going to scale? To have, I mean, you have a limited experiment in Bangladesh because there's a lot of this activity going on. But let's choose a country which is not as got such a strong tradition you know, some smaller country in Africa or somewhere like that. How do we have this working to scale? I'm not so sure the answer is a Canadian NGO should go and do it. I mean, they may have a contribution to make, but they can't do it. It has to be done inside those societies by those people. So what's your own experience, maybe from what you've been doing in the last few years, to actually replicate this model? Let me put it this way. Uh, it, the question may be asked from two different angles. Replication, scaling up, is something very difficult to achieve by process, as a process. This is one. Replication as a process is possible, but money is not available. That's the two sides of this question. On the first side, I would say if you design it right, replication becomes very simple. Designing should be, as uh, I was trying to mention, that when you do these five people working in uh, getting out of unemployment and it works by itself, it, it, it stands by itself, it's, uh, it grows by itself, that is a seed that you develop. When you know, if you created a seed which works, all it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a now plantation. Repeat this whole thing. You don't have to discover anything anymore. There'll be a little bit of adjustment somewhere, something. The land is a little tilted or even or something. But it's, it works. If you plant it in the right season, it grows. It by itself. So that process always create a modular thing. In Grameen Bank, what was the modular thing? In a sense, say, by branch is a modular thing. It's self-contained. If you destroy whole of Grameen Bank, it's still one bank can survive. Because it, it is not dependent on the entire system. It is its own money. It doesn't wait for anybody's money. It's their own deposit. You lend out the money and cover all the costs, pay for everybody, and give the borrowers who are the shareholders a dividend every year. So it's not dependent on 2,600 other branches. So that's why it can go anywhere you plan. 
That's why you could do it in Jackson Heights and every si single thing in New York City and so on. Now the question, will money be available? That's the question. Now that it works in New York City, people from other cities become very curious. They visit it, get very excited. Our problem is worse than New York. Why didn't you come and work, for, work in our city? It's a replica. We said, of course you would love to do your city. Wherever, whatever problem you have, this is our business. This is what we do. Give us the money. So how much money you need? I said, we have this very standard calculation for us. For each branch, give us $5 million. Why $5 million? He said, if each one of them is taken $1,500 as a loan, if there is 1,000 borrowers, you need one and a half million. So we assume that a branch comes to break even point if you have 4,000 borrowers. For 4,000 borrowers, you need $6 million. So we'll plow back the money so you can do it with $5 million. And this is our calculation. So money will be in the hands of the people, not with me. We are not taking money home to Bangladesh. We don't bring money from Bangladesh. We don't take money to Bangladesh. It's your money, stay here, but it will be self-sufficient, self-reliant. Start with one branch, $5 million, and if you're satisfied, if you want another branch, you give another $5 million. It's up to you. You are inviting us, we are wait for your call. They call. They said, we are desperately need you. Come and here is the money. So no, you put it in the account. Then we come. Then they put it in the account. Then we come. Then we start. So we have bran two branches in Los Angeles, two branches in San Francisco, one in Indianapolis. Each one is Houston, Tech, uh, Boston, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, and many in the pipeline. And the same thing. That's what I was explaining. If it works, people out of their own necessity say, please help us. Please do it for us. So we do that. And we, these are all local guys. We sent one person from Bangladesh just to avoid the long training period of understanding. So he comes, then he starts training the staff for the people here. Then they, these are all local staff. And they have never heard of Grameen Bank. They have never heard about microcredit, nothing. And he works with them and set it up. Bring it to the break-even point. That is done. That's it. So that's the whole idea. If you, if you, if replication is something that you already tested it. That's why you do it in a small way. If it works, the whole world will come to learn from you. The world has no option because the problem is the same. No matter whether you talk about Haiti, you talk about Montreal or uh, Ottawa, it doesn't matter. It's the same problem. Problem of unemployment, problem of uh, everything that you have list. So it's a question of where the location is. So if it works in one location, this is a global property now. Everybody will come to see how you do it, we want to do it. And if microcredit is a good example. People didn't change microcredit, they misused microcredit a lot for intention of making money. That's, a, that's where we say that there's a right microcredit, the wrong microcredit. Wrong microcredit is the one who used this method to make money for themselves. We created it as a social business. We wanted to make sure we solved the problem of the poor people. We didn't want to make money for it. And that's what we continue to do that. So some people are still following that format, the right microcredit. The wrong microcredit, oh, this is a good opportunity to make money out of the poor people. And then you hear about the high rate of interest, oppression, extractions, and so all kinds of things. Because they're interested in making money. They're not interested in what happens to the poor people. They want quick money. So to answer your question, yes, it is possible. Both process is possible and funding is also possible. Where does all these billions of dollars go if you create these things? Every decision maker will ask themselves, why am I giving this, why not this? Because there are examples now. So we have to create those examples. That's the challenge to us. Okay. We have five more minutes before we need to move to our next uh, appointment. Uh, who wants to ask a question? Otherwise, I still have one outstanding. <laughs> so then, but I'll still be with Dr. Ines. So your opportunity. So une dernière question. Oui, Marianne. And make poverty history. The um, We
Well, you can be the way. I mean, I, I cannot answer in a blanket way. What we did when the question came, you need to train people, you need to give test case chance. But I said, yes, if you want to do that, go ahead. If it works, it's easy. But we tried the other way. We concentrated a project on beggars. We'll lend money only to beggars. And our preference will be on generational beggars, who are not the one who just recently became beggars, but several generations they are beggars. So that the hardcore beggars. Let's just start with that. So we started talking to them, trying to understand how long they are doing the begging, what is their kind of money they get, what food they get, how do they survive, how many children they got, all the stories. And during the conversion, uh, conversation in a few days, we say, well, it's a hard life. Would you be interested in carrying some merchandise with you? Some fruits, some uh, toys for the kids, anything housewives would like to buy from you? And we try to make it sound very easy to them by saying, you're going there anyway. It's not extra work. Just carry something with you. So give people option whether they will give you something as a gift, as a, as a donation, or some food, some uh, money for you, or they would like to buy something for you. You, you. Nothing to lose. You go there, you give. You have two things now instead of one thing. So you have better option for yourself. They love this whole idea. We said we'll give you the money to take all this stuff, whatever you want to do. You tell us how much money you'll need and we'll give you the money. But that's a loan. You have to pay us back. They said, okay, we'll pay you. And we'll make it very simple for you. Simple, there is no time limit when you can pay us back. So never ever you'll become a loan defaulter because there's no time limit. And there'll be no interest on this. So you don't worry if I delay, this money will become big. This money will never become big. So and it's endless time and no interest. So make it very comfortable for them and gave them the money to do it. We thought maybe we'll have 1,000, 2,000 beggars in the program. It instantly became very popular. Within months, we have more than 100,000 beggars in the program. And the loan they were asking for, $12, $15, $18, maximum $20. That's it. And we start giving it. And they start their business. And they enjoy it because now people are buying things from them. People are happy that they, they say that it's not what they buy from us. For the first time, they open the door and let us come in. Otherwise, they will deal it to the window. Give something, it's okay, you go. Uh, you are hungry, your children are hungry, I give you some food, I give you some money. So we did that. So the, the condition we give, if you pay us back this money that we gave you, the $10 or $12, we'll, you can ask for more now. So they bring the $12 back, they give me 20 they bring their twenty dollars back. They say forty. That's it. There was no conditions of tough conditions. And if they don't pay back, they are not guilty because I'm still trying. I couldn't succeed. And they become very smart. They know which house is good for selling, which house is good for begging, very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just like any other human being. They know. Which, they know their market. They know their market precisely. They know their market. So this is how we started, and we make it happen. And within about, I would say, a year and a half, 25,000 borrowers stopped begging completely because they saw this one is doing well. Why do I have to beg now? I can take more merchandise to that. So we did that. Not that it solves all the problem, because this is an experiment. We continued, and now they become regular government bank borrowers. They pay interest, they pay regular. But this was a special class. They didn't have to belong to any group. They didn't have to bring to anything. They don't, we, we told them, Grameen Bank has no regulation rules for you. You make the rules, we follow the rules. You tell us what is your rule, and we follow it. So that's it. So I'll not dismiss this. Things. It's impossible. OK. Well, uh, thank you very much, thank uh, you. Thank Dr. Yunus, for uh, being with us uh, today. I think it's very instructive provoking uh, in some ways, but also very enriching, I think, to a discourse that's probably quite often only sometimes a bit stale and sometimes trying to focus on the private sector like if it was a magic bullet. And this is a this wealth of experience of trying to manage, uh, the, if you want, the, 
the uh, synergies between both is really, I think, very useful and very refreshing. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.